So in this video, we're going to walk through the entire installation of System Center Service Manager 2012, uh, the RTM. Uh, the video was actually taken over a period of about five hours as I was leading a workshop installing Service Manager on a lot of other environments. So there's uh, some editing going on, but it does walk through every step you actually require to get up and running completely. So for this, you're going to need an Active Directory domain, a SQL Server 2008 R2 SB1 latest community update box and two servers of Windows Server 2008 R2 SP1 on them. So here I'm actually setting up the three Active Directory user accounts you're going to need for the Service Manager installation. There's a Service Manager Work account, a Service Manager Service account, and a Service Manager Reporting account. So these are just normal regular domain users, nothing special here. And one thing I've also got a service manager admins group. So the service manager admins group, so I'm showing here, SVC MGR admins. This you're actually going to use to specify who are the administrators in service manager. So put the users in this group who you want to be administrators. So again, I've got those three accounts and make sure you set the password to not expire just to save yourself problems, unless you've got some procedure in your organization to handle synchronizing service accounts. So three user accounts, work, service, and reporting. And now what I need to actually do is go and make that service manager workflow account a local administrator on our service manager management server. So there's going to be two servers running service manager. One is the management server, one is the data warehouse. So we the management server first. So make sure it's local administrator. Then we're going to add the .NET framework 3.51. So we just let this go through. One of the nice things in 2012 is for most other components, it actually helps set up everything required automatically. We're gonna need some of these things later, but for now we can skip it. There are two prerequisites, which it will actually show you if you're missing them when you try and install Service Manager. I'm gonna download them now. So what I actually need is, so the links for these will be provided as part of the installation but I'm going to install the SQL Server 2008 R2 native client so I'm running the R2 SQL Server if you're running 2008 you would get the 2008 native client so I'm going to save this package um, but just run it save it because we're actually going to use it later on the data warehouse as well so you want the x64 version save that away So I'd like to create folders where I store the dependencies for each product. I have to come to install it again in the future. And now we need the analysis. Component. So again, this link is right there within the service manager when you perform the installation but it's just part of the SQL Server 2008 feature pack. And what we're actually just gonna install is the analysis management objects. So again, we're gonna select the x64 version of this and save that to that same folder. And then we're gonna run it. This is actually just showing me for the RC, we had those same two requirements anyway. So I could have just used those that I already had, but for now we've got a separate RTM. So these are really quick.
So I'm actually ready to launch the installation. So this VM's actually got four gig of memory and two virtual procs. Uh, make sure you enter your product key. So it's one product key for all of System Center 2012. Otherwise you have to install as an email. So enter the product key. I'm obviously not gonna show that right now, but I have typed it in. And I'm gonna check the, I've read the terms, so I can click next. So once you've typed that in, we're actually gonna move on to the next step. Default installation location. It's gonna check for those prerequisites. So this is where you can see it's checking for things like the SQL Server 2008 analysis management objects, that native client. And if it's not there, we show you the link. So this is really just saving time. Specify the service manager database. So this is the, the separate SQL Server 2008 R2 SP1 installation. If you have multilingual requirements, you need to set the collation of the database same as we had to do for the previous version of Service Manager. If you are only using English, you don't have to worry about it. So for my environment, I'm just using English. I don't need to do that, but it will remind you every time. You need to make sure you have the full text services installed on the SQL Server. For Service Manager, it uses that as part of the standard Service Manager components to so make sure your SQL installation has full text search. If it hasn't, it will actually error there anyway. So we're going to specify a Service Manager Admins group we created earlier. Give it a management group name. This is where we're entering two of those accounts we created. So first is the service manager service account. And it's actually a complaint to me. I didn't make it local admin. If I can type the password correctly. So we're just gonna leap back to service manager really quickly and make this service manager service account a local administrator in addition to that workflow account. So this is the account the service will run as. Now we're actually gonna go and configure the account that workflows will run as. And this is the account that, for example, will have a mailbox in exchange. If you wanna actually read in from email. Specify if you wanna participate in the program or not. Is it gonna use Windows Update? I don't believe it actually does use Windows Update yet anyway, but if at some point it does, Confirm your settings. So we've finished. Obviously, it actually takes a lot longer than that. There's a lot of management packs to get imported, so you, you may want to go and uh, grab a drink when that's installing. We're going to perform a backup of the encryption key used to protect the data in there, so make sure you put that somewhere securely. And we just type in the password to secure that. So at this point, we actually have Service Manager installed. Just connect it to our local server. And there we go. Well, what we're actually gonna do now is install the self-service portal. See, I've got no connectors, there's nothing there yet. So the self-service portal is actually based on SharePoint. 
So you can have a separate SharePoint server or you can use SharePoint Foundation, which is what I'm going to use here. Now I just do a quick installation of SharePoint here, the very basic. So it's going to use the short name of the server by default. I just like the NetBIOS name. That does cause a problem if you want to use an SSL certificate on a fully qualified domain name of the server. So what you're going to see here is I do a very quick installation, but it uses the NetBIOS name. And I'm going to create a certificate from my domain PKI infrastructure. So it does all the prereqs for you. You can just go through this wizard. I'm going to request the certificate for my PKI infrastructure for the fully qualified name of my server. Once I've finished this installation, I'm going to have to actually go through and fix a couple of things to make um, SharePoint and Service Manager correctly use the fully qualified name instead. Now I got an error when I ran some of these prerequisites. All I did was run it again and it worked. So I'm not 100% sure why the filter pack failed, but you see, you can check the file. You can see if you do get a problem, look at it. But for me, I was able to just relaunch this again and then it worked. So I guess it's like a reboot of prerequisite checks. Okay, hit finish and run it again. That's how it worked. So one option you could do is when I'm doing this installation here, I just accept the, the quickest, oh, probably, you have to reboot. So after doing all of this stuff, I have to do a quick reboot. So I'm gonna reboot the box and then we'll launch this again. So I'm back up. What I'm actually gonna do here is actually go and request that certificate before I launch the SharePoint. So I'm just creating a domain certificate. I'm gonna use the fully qualified domain name for the cert. So it's important the name, not actually here, but when I specify the friendly name, it needs to match the fully qualified name of my server exactly, because that's what's gonna get compared against the certificate name. So I'm gonna select my domain controller I have. I have Active Directory Certificate Services installed, and the friendly name is gonna match the name of my server. So now I have a certificate that will be trusted by all the computers in my domain. Now, if you wanted to offer this out on a wider scale, you can always use a third party certificate authority to generate this certificate. So you don't have to do this. You can use a self-signed, you can continue using the short name, but in my environment, I wanted a trusted certificate. So we're going to launch that installation again. So right now, if I clicked server farm instead, it would have actually given me the options to go into advanced and set the name. By doing what I've done here, it does a very quick basic installation that really lets you do nothing. <laughs> so we run through the configuration wizard, and this really just does its own tasks. It used a local little SQL addition. It's not using the external SQL box. It's a very basic install. So again, use the other option, create a SQL farm, which can still be a single server to have more control over the installation. So now we have foundation installed.
And you'll notice it is using the NetBIOS name, so the short name. So now I'm going to install the .NET Framework 4.0 because I'm going to need this actually as part of the self-service portal that I'm about to install. So I download .NET Framework and I install it. And again, it, these things all get checked. If you didn't have it, it's going to run a prerequisite check and show you're missing it. While that's installing, um, I'm actually in the SharePoint Central Administration site. And what I'm going to do quickly while that's actually installing is I want to go and actually change the SharePoint site to the fully qualified domain name. So I'm in Central Administration. App management, then I go to configure alternate access mappings, and I can actually here just change that URL. I'm actually going to repeat this later on for the SharePoint, sorry, not SharePoint, the service manager. SharePoint site that we're going to create. So I'm just selecting what collection, so my default SharePoint site, and I'm just going to add a URL for the fully qualified domain name. You notice I have an edit public URLs in that left hand corner. I can select that and actually change it to the fully quite as well, which I'm actually going to do for the service manager. So just even when I type in the long name up there, it then defaults to the short because that's the public, the default. But we're going to change that for Service Manager. Now we can install the web portal. I want both parts. Again, if I was installing this not on the Service Manager server, which is what I'm doing, I can do this on a completely separate server. I could separate what components I want. I can install this on existing SharePoint installation. But it's run through and it passed. See here, I can select that certificate I created. It's complaining about the collation again. I'm going to select the database for my service manager. So which account I actually want to run the self-service portal under, so I'm going to use my same service manager service account. Notice we're using port 444 because 443 is already in use. And the account I used just then, it needs to be a SharePoint admin and my service manager service wasn't. So in your environment, you could use a different account. Um, for that in a lab, it's not a big deal. But that's why I use the administrator. You could use service manager service if you make service manager service a SharePoint admin. So the portal is now installed. And you'll notice again at the top right, it's using the short name. 
for the Service Manager 444 SM Portal. So that's the website we're going to use to access. So I'm going to jump to that site now just to show it to you. So it's complaining because obviously I selected a certificate that has a fully qualified domain name, which is fine. I can say ignore it and it will still render. It's going to take a while the first time because it has to generate um, run all the sort of just in time compilation of some of the components. But it will show. I'm not really going to get the complete experience because there's other components within the portal that are linking to other objects. And when the certificate doesn't match, it will refuse to show them. So I'm going to install Silverlight quickly. I don't have it on the server because the service manager uses Silverlight for most of its graphical interface. So we're going to Click that and actually install Silverlight. But what's going to happen is we're still not going to see anything because behind the scenes it's trying to talk to HTTPS slash slash SMO SMO1 colon four 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 slash components and a certificate that says no, this doesn't match. So it's going to say it's not secure and it will refuse to load. So I'm just going to see a big white screen here. Which isn't really that useful. So we're now going to go and actually change the SharePoint, the Service Manager SharePoint site to use a fully qualified domain name so we stop getting this certificate error. And then we're going to actually go in and change the application config to use the fully qualified domain name. And there's going to be a third step to just edit a config file. So it's really just three steps. I'm going to walk through three of those now. And again, it wouldn't have been necessary if during the SharePoint install, we specified a fully qualified name as we did an advanced install because we just did the basic, we didn't get that opportunity. But it's good to know how to do this if you ever hit this problem. So the first thing I'm going to do is back in that central administration site. I would have gone to application management, configure alternate access mappings, same as we did for the SharePoint site. I'm going to select the new service manager site. So I'm doing edit public URLs. So this is actually changing it for SharePoint, the default SharePoint site. What I want to do is change it for now Service Manager. So I take Change Alternate, I select Service Manager. So now I can actually type in the full name. So now we can see if my public URL is using the fully qualified domain name. That's all you have to do. So when I refresh, it, it stays on that. It's going to be no certificate errors. So the next thing is I'm still getting this white screen. So I need to actually go and tell basically the ASP components that to use the fully qualified domain name instead of the short name. So if I'm going to use IIS Manager, I'm going to go and select my site, my service manager portal. Under the ASP.NET section, I have application settings. And I'm going to change this URL to the fully qualified. So that certificate will match. So notice this is connecting to the SharePoint sort of default content. So now if I click refresh, it should be able to connect to that. 
and it loads in my silver light, which is great. So remember, what did I do? I changed both the SharePoint public URL and I changed the service manager SharePoint site URL to a fully qualified domain name. And that's going through, and I don't really have anything to show you anyway, but at least now it's functional. There is one other problem with the URL I found in the past, so we're gonna fix that now. And that's actually when you try and open knowledge base articles. So while that's going, if I actually jump over and create a knowledge base article, so we can actually go and search and try and find help. So if I was to do a search now, it won't find anything, there aren't any. So I'm gonna quickly create a knowledge base article just to show you what the problem is and then show you how to fix it. So go into library, knowledge, and I create a new knowledge article. And I'm just gonna do test. I'm not even gonna put any content in, so it'll be a blank document. But if you scroll down, you can do internal, external, etc. To actually make it show something, this is just gonna be a blank document. And I need to set this to published. So actually after this, I need to reopen it. I could have done it straight in there, I just forgot. So at the top left, so you can see I specify external intent, inter, <laughs> internal content if I wanted to, set this to published, so that will show in the site. So if I go back and search now, I have it, if I select it, it's gonna try and load a document and it's gonna fail. So what I'm doing here, I'm gonna edit the web config file for the site. I'm gonna search for the content host absolute. And there we see it's got the short name. I'm just gonna put in the full name. And save. So this file is again, so again, just search for that. You're gonna find it under the INET pub WW root system center service manager portal content host and then just edit that file and put in the fully qualified name. I'm then going to recycle the app pool in IIS. You don't always have to do this, sometimes it will just automatically recycle. Um, if it does great, if it doesn't, it's very easy to do, just go into application pools select the service manager app pool and select recycle. So now it's working and I'm gonna get a fabulous blank article so I've got nothing in it. But it now works. So we now have Service Manager installed with the SharePoint integrated self-service portal. So the next thing we can do is we can connect it. So I can connect it to Active Directory and it will start pulling in information about users and computers I connect it to Configuration Manager to get detailed inventory about some of these items. You can see here I can already create sort of the basic incident if I go to the list view, but my service catalog is blank. And I'm actually gonna show you how to add something to that a bit later. Okay, so let's actually get some connections going.
Okay, no, nope. <laughs> my bad. I'm getting confused. So we're actually going to set up the data warehouse next. So this is on a data warehouse server. And again, I'm adding the service manager service account to the local administrators group. So this is a separate box. This is not the same server. This is a second server. And I've made service manager service. Remember the local administrators group. And again, I'm installing the .NET framework. It's a requirement. And then we're going to reinstall those other two SQL prerequisites that I installed previously on the service manager management server. So let's finish installing. So we're done. Now we go and install those other prerequisites. So the actual SQL server we use for Data Warehouse, it could be a separate SQL server. Um, it's really going to depend on sort of the capabilities of that SQL installation. I'm using the same server on mine. So now select the Service Manager Data Warehouse Management Server. Again, you would type in your product key here. So I'm going to type mine in, so it's just not showing it. Click next, select the default installation option, it's doing the checks. So as you notice on this one, it it actually wants four processor cores. And so I've only got two, so it's giving me a warning about that, and it wants eight gig of memory. Think of this data warehouse server as doing a, a lot of work. But the good news is you don't have to have it running all the time. Um, in a lab environment, I can actually turn it off, maybe run it once a day to do some checks for running when I want to do a lot of reporting, etc. So in lab environments, it's not something you have to have running the entire time. So I'm going to specify my server again, my SQL box. So I all the details for them. I do need analysis services as well. On the SQL server for this one. So I need reporting services up and running. I need analysis services up and running, so that needs to be installed on the SQL box. The management group name must be different from the management group name used on the service manager itself, the management server. So you can just put DW underscore in front of it, which is there by default. I can 
have the same administrators. So now that it's, you can actually notice there's this box. I've taken the manual steps. And click that link and it will actually open a document of everything you need to do. But basically, there's this file, the reporting code, I have to copy to my SQL server and paste it into a specific folder, which is the SQL reporting services 10 underscore 50 folder because I'm 2008 R2 so I'm going to paste this file into the bin folder there we go and there's an edit I need to make to the config file the RSSRV policy file so again just open that up in notepad or on XML editor XML editor will keep it looking a lot tidier And I'm basically adding a block of code that I can paste it from the document that's linked to from that data warehouse dialog box on service manager. And I'm adding it to these code groups. Just at the bottom of them. So it's kind of untidy, but for right now, I'm not going to worry about it. Now I say yes, I've taken those steps. I have previously configured SQL reporting services, just the basic URLs, etc. Going to specify my service manager service account again to run the data warehouse services as. This is now that third account we originally created the reporting account to run the report test. So this is where we need that analysis services installed on that database. So I should type in the wrong server here. It should be OM01. Now one thing here is I previously had the release candidate installed of Service Manager. And I've gone through and I've deleted all the databases, but I hadn't deleted the analysis database. So it throws out an error. And so for right now, I'm actually just gonna go and select a different one. But later on, I'll actually show you how, I, how to delete that. We'll jump back to that. But lots of people watching what I was doing, so was, I just wanted to push ahead with the installation. Now what I'm now doing is, so this account needs to be a local admin on the SQL server. So I'm actually adding my service manager service account to be a local administrator. This is my SQL server now. So I'm going to the local administrator's group of my SQL server. 
and adding the service main to service account as a requirement for that data mark. So I've added that, this was on the SQL box. Now I'm jumping back over and the credentials are accepted. Again, those same options for update, etc. Show me a summary of my choices and it's going to go and do the installation. Let's take some time again. I just want that's finishing, this is how I would have deleted that existing database. You need to connect to the analysis services server type from within SQL Server Management Studio instead of database engine. And then when I connect to the analysis services, you notice now I have an analysis services view and there's my old database. So then I can select it and delete it. So I don't need it anymore. So if I've done that first, I could have choose a default name. So that's just how you would do it if you needed to. So we're back, we've completed, so we now have a data warehouse. So we have the service manager management server and we have the data warehouse. Just gonna back up that encryption key for the data warehouse. Again, keep these somewhere safe. <laughs> So now I'm actually jumping back to my service manager box and I'm going to link them together. So I'm going to connect my service manager management server to my data warehouse server. So we go to the administration workspace and at the bottom you actually see register with service manager. So I'm just going to click that. Type in the name of my data warehouse server you just created. So notice who I'm logged in as must be an administrative user. So I mean, I'm basically logged on as a domain admin to do these installations. what account we're going to use to the connection. So again, this must be an administrative privileges. This is actually just going to use our service manager service account. So we just type in the password again. Now this process actually takes quite a long time. Uh, it's completely finalized because the management server is pushing management packs, um, deploying information. I mean, this can take a couple of hours. So what we'll see is we'll get a data warehouse workspace will appear, but we won't get reporting yet. It has to wait until all that population sits. So the report, report deployment is in progress. Until that finishes, I'm not going to see my reporting workspace. But I do now have my data warehouse.
but it's not populated yet correctly. I mean, if I go and look and I can see, for example, the data warehouse jobs, I think there's just like two. Whereas there's going to be a lot more once the process is finished. Yeah. So right now it's running that synchronization of the management packs. So now we've got the connection, we can actually start doing some of the, not niceties, but actually giving it a bit more functional. So really the whole point of service manager is connectivity to other systems, to the rest of the system center. So I'm actually just quickly, I'm gonna dump some images I've created. They're just like a little warning logo, a cloud logo. So we're gonna use those in a minute when we actually create a service offering. So these can be any sort of small images that you can manually create. You'll see them when I actually go and create the service offering. So if I'm closing and opening it to see if the reporting is populated yet, but it's very optimistic. So there's still no reporting, it's still running the job. Yep, report deployment is still in progress. So I'm gonna go and add a connector. And in this video, all we're gonna really do is connect to Active Directory. Um, I, also am, I am also gonna to connect to Configuration Manager. Um, but that's really just so later on I can show that we combine information from different sources into one object in Service Manager, which is the whole point. It's Configuration Management Database for your entire organization. So I'm specifying a name for my connector. I'm using the entire domain. Test the connection. So you can be more granular. You can select a specific um, organizational unit, for example, within the domain. I can select more objects. So I'm just grabbing all the computers, printers, users, and groups. And then once I create this, I need to actually run an initial synchronization to make it actually start getting that data. So we now have that created. I can now select it and run a synchronization. As you can see it's never run yet, so click synchronize now. And then as it's running, it'll show me the percentage used and as the users and computers start to populate. So this is just the default, I don't have anything there yet. And then once that synchronization has kicked in, objects will just start appearing. So that's now you can see it's populated with the computer objects from Active Directory. But there's not really much known about them at this point. It's only what AD knows. So what I'm actually going to do next is actually connect it to Configuration Manager as well 
because then you'll see information from Configuration Manager. So all the hardware, the software, the patch status will be known about the objects as well. So basically we just don't know anything. We know that the objects are there, but all we know is the information AD knows. So I'm just going to quickly create a connector to Configuration Manager. I've already pre-configured the permissions I need on the Configuration Manager database, and I'll show those quickly. I need to make sure I select the right management pack, so I'm using the 2012. So what I'm doing is I'm specifying the SQL server that holds the configuration manager database. So this isn't the configuration manager server. This is the name of the SQL box. So I need to get its database name so I can jump over to the management studio to check. I can show you the permissions quickly. So I can see I have a CM underscore lab. The security of that. If I actually select it. Go to security. I'll see my service manager service account. So I've already added it. So this is the account that is used to do the connection. I've got DB data reader. So you can see here DB underscore data reader. And the extract. So I can show that here as well if I just go to my overall security and look at my logons. I can see my service manager service account. Under user mapping I can select the databases I want to map permissions for. Again I can select the CM lab you can see I've got that data reader, public, and SMS DB role underscore extract. So with those three permissions, I can now specify that. Test the connection to make sure I have the right permissions. I can specify now what collections from Configuration Manager, I actually want to import in. So I'm actually just going to select all of them. So as we have a synchronization schedule, summary, and create. Once it's created, I'm actually then going to go and manually run it. So again, it can start populating the data. So later on, I can actually show you what that unified information would actually look like. So maybe connect to C finished. Now my configuration manager, I'm going to do synchronize now. This one can take a long time, depending on how many objects you have in configuration manager. 
if you think about what it's doing, I'm pulling in the inventory information, the software, the hardware, the patch status, there's a lot of information there. But as it's synchronizing over time, it will start populating the configuration items within Service Manager with that additional information. So while that's running, I want to get something added to our category view as part of our service catalog. So we have some request offerings that are published by default and we saw that incident request. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer out that generic incident request, the English one, to the service catalog. So I can only publish a published request offering. So it has to be in published status versus so I need a request offering that's been published. I'm now going to go and add a service offering. So I'm going to go to my service offerings. I'm going to say, hey, create a service offering. There's lots of details you can type in, but you don't need to. There's like, I'm just going to show you very, very quick just to get something up and running in there. So you're going to give it a name and a description. So this is requesting. Now it's the image. So it needs to be 32 by 32. So I'm going to raise an instant. So I'm going to select one of those images I copied over earlier. I create the little warning triangle. You can create categories. And that's actually done as part of the, the list views. So you can create your own categories. Select language. So I'm going to want English United States. So we have an overview that's shown on the main sort of portal homepage. Then we can have a description when you actually go and click on it to get more information. I'm actually going to create it in a new management pack rather than modifying one of the existing ones. I'm just creating a custom service offerings management pack. You can get detailed information, service of agreement. I mean, you don't have to do any of this. So I'm leaving all that out. I don't have any related services. I don't have any related knowledge base articles. But what you do have to put in is a related request offering or it just won't show up. So it has to link to a request offering. So I'm going to put in my generic instant request. And that request offering had its own image as well that's just part of that published one. I'm going to change it to publish so it shows up in the website. Just going to give it an owner. So I mean, this is the important part. I have that request offering. So you can now go and create lots of other request offerings. And there could be run books and orchestrator. Um, really anything custom, any request offering you want to create, and then you can offer those out. So I don't want to create any more right now, so I'm just going to hit cancel. So I've got that there. Now if I go back to the website.
I now have a service offering. And I can click that and it will go through, show me the different details I specified. Notice it has its own little icon that can be used. And the user can go to the request and they can actually go and raise an instant request. Now the final customization um, is if you notice when we're actually looking at this, if I scroll up, my portal is always called SM portal. Now I may not want that, I'm probably not going to want that in your environment. So it's very, very easy to change that. So see if it's SM portal. If I scroll up. I just have to see it again. So we're just going to change it. It's very, very easy to change. Go to my site actions and then site settings. So I'm logged on with someone that has uh, administrative permissions of the SharePoint site. Under look and feel, I do title, description, and icon. And I'm just going to change that title. And that's it. I click OK. and it's already been changed. So if I actually jump back just to the default site, I now have my new name available. So I've already customized it so it's more fitting with <clears throat> what I want my organization's interface to look like. So there we go. So that's, I mean, we're up and running. So what I've now done is I've waited some time <laughs> um, to let all of the reports populate and synchronize over. I've had dinner. <laughs> so if I now launch the Service Manager Console again, we're going to see that reporting tab has shown up and I have my various reports available to me. So all the various types of reports I can run in my environment. My config manager synchronization also fi finished. I can actually show you those data warehouse jobs notes. There's a lot more of them now. So if I now look at one of my computers, what I'm going to see is the combined knowledge. I'm going to see stuff from config manager as well. If I had my connection to Ops Manager, I would see any alerts about that object. It's going to bring everything into this single place. So look at my terminal server box. And I now can see software information, patch status, patches I'm missing, all coming from Configuration Manager. And I can see that in the history of where this info came from. So I hope that was useful. Uh, you now have Service Manager 2012 up and running completely with a web portal and a service catalog. And in sort of some future videos, we'll actually walk through connecting to Exchange, Ops Manager, Orchestrator, and just add in some more custom workflows. Uh, I appreciate your time, and I hope that was useful. Thank you.